I'm in the mood to stick my fist up your ass and pull out billions. You get it? Hello, everybody. <laughs> Welcome to the Geezerology Gazette for Monday, October 11th, 2021. That was, uh, I just played a, a, a quick clip from a trailer for the season four of Goliath, which, which Bob is a, a fan of, and it just premiered on uh, Amazon a week or so ago. So Bob's going to talk about that a little bit later. But before we get there, let's uh, let's run through a, a couple of quick news items. Bob, you want to start us off? Sure. Okay. Um, first out the gate, uh, one of my favorite hard rock bands, uh, Deep Purple, is releasing a new album on November 26th. And this is going to be an interesting departure for the band. Its uh, album is called Turning to Crime, and it's a entire album of covers of uh, roots music. And uh, they're covering material originally recorded by people like Fleetwood Mac, Bob Dylan, Cream, Bob Seeger, Little Feet, uh, Ray Charles, the Yardbirds, and more. And um, the band did this album entirely remotely due to lockdown restrictions. So they sent tracks back and forth to one another and put the whole thing together remotely. And uh, what I find really interesting is kind of an eclectic collection of stuff and the band at one time held the distinction of being having held the loudest concert ever in history is covering stuff like the Battle of New Orleans and <laughs> um, Rockin' Pneumonia, the Boogie Woogie Flu, and Watching the River Flow, and Dixie Chicken. So I'm looking forward to this just because I think it could be a fun thing to hear these hard rock guys uh, do some of this stuff. Yeah, I saw I saw that earlier this week, and I actually held on to it in case uh, in case it, it got past you. Uh, yeah, this sounds really interesting. I see uh, uh, Bob Ezrin, a uh, long time. He'd been around a long time. He he was a producer of it. I see. He he produced Alice Cooper. He produced a couple of Lou Reeds, and um, he'd been around a long, long time. And uh, yeah, I, th I thought it was pretty interesting. That that. Uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing hearing some of that. Watching the river flow. I have a track list here. Watching the river flow, Bob Dylan, Let the Good Times Roll, Ray Charles, Little Feet's Dixie Chicken, Yardbird Shapes of Things, Bob Seeger's Lucifer, Cream's White Room, uh, Rockin' Pneumonia and the Boogie Woogie Flu. <laughs> So I, I so I guess it's not like you're saying. I mean, they they never got together in a studio and did this. It, it, right, like you were saying, they did it remotely, and and uh, and you know they all they all did their parts separately. And I guess they just got all the tracks to Ezra and who put them all together, probably or something like that. Right. <laughs> that sounds kind of cool. Yeah. So, you know, and Ian Gillen, the uh, um, classic vocalist for Deep Purple, who's on this album, I think has got one of the best hard rock voices out there and it's got very powerful and great range so it's going to be interesting to see how he handles some of this more subtle material yeah the lineup appears to be ian pace stephen morse ian gillen donald airy and i can't see who this fifth one is yeah. Yeah. Um, pace, pace and gillen go back to the classic lineup yeah you know, and the others yeah. are people who've come in at various points in, in right. the band's career right <laughs> that's that's pretty cool looking forward to that all right i got uh one other thing I i'd like to touch on real quickly uh, i think it's because i think it's important in what's going on um you've got a lot of music artists uh, who were in the twilight of their careers who have been selling off their catalogs selling off all of their music rights and stuff and the latest to do this is tina turner and uh, she's just sold her music rights to uh, BMG. And um, so it's the latest trend in this thing of major legacy artists cashing in on their copyrights. And um, Tina included the deal as Turner's artist share for her recordings, along with publishing rights, neighboring rights, and her name, image, and likeness. Uh, BMG didn't disclose the financial details and but BMG calls the deal the single largest artist acquisition the company has ever executed. And rumors are that it could be north of $50 million. So um, a little trivia thing interesting, Turner, who many call the queen of rock and roll, 
was the second artist to ever grace the cover of Rolling Stone magazine after John Lennon, who was on the debut uh, cover. And she was also the first woman and the first black artist to grace the cover of that classic rock magazine. So, I just well, to she, she, was, she was the second one behind Lennon? Yeah, she was on so, the cover. So, of the she was, so she was the first non-Beatle of any... <laughs> yeah. Trying to find crazy color of Rolling really Stone. Right, right. right. <laughs> All right. I didn't. I never do that. I never do yeah, that. I didn't either until I until I read this article. <laughs> and, and so those are the things the, I got for right now. That's that's happening a lot lately. It's like all of these all of these uh, artists, you know, entering their. I don't know what, what you call them. Their 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 super senior years, their twilight mm -hmm. years, whatever you want to call it. Uh, yeah, a lot of them selling off, selling off their catalogs. I think probably a couple of things going on, probably, uh, you know, just, just getting some, getting, getting together some cash for their heirs, mm -hmm. you know, preparing for that yeah. day. And, and, uh, and probably also it's, you know, it's, you know, the income hasn't been there the last few years. So, you know, so they decided to just cash up. Oh, I know Dylan's done it. Neil Young's done yeah. it, and a whole bunch yeah. of others have. Yeah. yeah. D, what's up? Any? You got anything? Just one uh, <clears throat> note. It might be an interesting footnote for Doors fans. This is a a, a big, uh, uh, <laughs> not big news, but interest to them and and fans of the, the Doors, and particularly Mark Jim Morrison, his. Uh, <clears throat> Love partner, love, love romance for about a year, uh, over a year. Patricia Keneally Morrison died at the age of 75 in New York. Um, however, uh, I just came across this not long ago, and apparently she died July 21st, but her management, uh, they delayed announcing it. Um, they say her uh, death was due to a heart condition. So... Uh, Patricia Keneally, um, she was noted for being one of the first female uh, rock critics of the uh, late 60s era. Uh, she went on to take a reporting and then editor-in-chief position at Jazz and Pop, which was a fairly influential uh, music review magazine at that, at that time. And that's how she met Morrison. Uh, the doors were in New York and she interviewed him and they kept up correspondence and then they kept up a long range romance, which according uh, to her, uh, from what I, the, some notes that she said it suited them perfectly when they would get together, they would, you know, get together. Then the doors would go on tour and she would go about doing her business. She was mm -hmm. most famously uh, remembered for her part being played in the Oliver Stone movie, the doors, uh, the scene depicted, actually she was, in the movie, uh, she didn't play herself. She played a Wicca priestess, and she went on to say that uh, Oliver Stone misportrayed her. She wasn't a Wicca priestess; she was a Celtic pagan. And the uh, ceremony that her and Morrison did do was called the Celtic hand fasting, where they sweat each other's uh, hands and mix the blood together and all that. So uh, her part character was played by Kathleen Quinlan. Anyway, uh, after um, Morrison passed, she went on to continue to have a, a literary career. She wrote a series of rock and roll mysteries. One of them was called Go Ask Malice and uh, a few others. And then she wrote some uh, Celtic uh, fantasy stories. Uh, she's quite proud of her Irish Celtic background. Mm -hmm. And um, she also wrote a book called Strange Days, My Life With and Without Jim Morrison. Mm -hmm. And uh, she was highly critical of uh, Oliver Stone's portrayal of Morrison and the Doors and her, uh, which <laughs> she, she was in agreement with Ray Manzarek on that right, one. Right, right, right. And um, she doesn't, uh, she leaves a brother, two brothers, and uh, that's, that's her... Uh, entry uh, part of the the doors uh, story she also believes that uh, morrison's uh, girlfriend at the time uh, when they went to paris she believes that she was pretty much responsible for morrison dying um 
you know, she, she's said in a couple of writings that uh, she was a junkie and she was starting to influence Jim, who was doing all sorts of things. And she doesn't think it was intentional, but she feels like just through neglect, maybe she just, you know, she didn't, she didn't take care of him. So well, then, then, then she claimed that she was a legal, uh, they got legally married. <laughs> Only in the Celtic tradition, oh, okay. <laughs> they, oh, okay. They, okay. there was no birth, there's no marriage certificate. But, she, but, but yeah, but she, but she, but she has always called herself Jim Morrison's widow, right? Yeah, yeah, she did. I think that was kind of her claim to fame after Morrison passed. I, right. I think it opened doors for her, and yeah, you know things like that. And then she legally, you know, added Morrison after her uh, her own. Uh, last name Keneally so I don't know I, I think she she played it for all she could but uh you know she said that uh, and I forget more the name of Morrison's uh girlfriend at the last couple of years but uh she had nothing but disdain for her you know right yeah and, anyway so that's it uh Patricia Re Keneally my, yeah Refer Refresh my memory if I'm correct on this. Was Patricia Keneally the one who was responsible for that famous photo of Jim in, in her fur coat and necklace, or am I thinking of somebody else? Uh, yeah, yeah, that was her. That was her. her. Okay. That was her. I don't know if she shot the photos, but it was her. But that was her clothing and her right. accessories that, that Morrison yeah. was wearing, and she, and she was at least at the photo shoot. I, I'm, I'm not sure if she actually shot the photos or not. She may have. I just don't. I just don't remember. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I just one. Just so. Uh, just uh, one real quick thing before we move on. I I, I did uh, see a couple of days ago that uh, Genesis uh, had four more shows left on their Euro European leg of their tour that they had to cancel the other day. Actually, they say it's postponed. They're going to reschedule them, but. Uh, Apparently, uh, so they put out a statement. They didn't say specifically who, but they said that there was a COVID infection of band members. They didn't say which band members or how many or anything like that. But, And they also said that, uh, quote, the government, I don't know which government that they were referring to, but the government uh, advised them to, uh, to cancel their shows. They, they had one show scheduled for Glasgow, and uh, on Friday night, and then I think Sunday night, they had, uh, or over the weekend, Saturday and Sunday, they had three shows scheduled in London. And that was supposed to be the end of their uh, European tour, and they called those off. And they're still planning on uh, <clears throat> hitting the uh, North American leg on the tour. They have something, I think they have 13 shows scheduled for the Eastern United States and Canada in November and December. They're still planning on doing those shows and they're saying that they will reschedule the, uh, the, the four shows that were canceled later, but they, you know, they don't know when. But the thing that got me here is that, uh, is that the band statement and I keep I keep reading the statement, thinking it's probably Tony Banks because Tony Banks is pretty much the guy who uh, who speaks for for the band most for the most part. But he called this an quote unlucky turn of events, mm -hmm. which I thought was uh, kind of a weird <laughs> kind of a weird way to describe it. It's like it's COVID. We're in a pandemic. You know, there's nothing unlucky about it. It was kind. Of, it was kind of predictable. You know? oh, exactly. Yeah. 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 Um, um, but yeah, they but they but their statement said they plan to reschedule those missed shows. But but they also said before that that they are that Phil Collins has said that after 2021 he's done. He's not going to tour anymore. So who knows? Who knows if they're rescheduling these shows or not um out of curiosity scott do you have any information about <clears throat> what size <clears throat> concert halls <clears throat> they're playing at and what kind of crowds oh, they're they're, they're playing big uh arena sort of places are they? yeah yeah and are, are they selling out or uh you know? i i don't know that for a fact but i get the impression that they that they are i, I get the impression that they're not having trouble selling tickets uh 
but yeah, I mean, uh, the few videos I've seen, it, I mean, it looked like there, you know, there were big, big places and big crowds. So, uh, and also, uh, Alanis Morissette has canceled her uh, European tour after she did about three or four shows. She canceled it not because of COVID, because anybody got COVID or anything like that, but she was trying to travel with her two children, and she found that it was just impossible to do this tour with her two children in tow. So instead of just sending her children home, she decided that uh, she's going to cancel her tour, which I thought was kind of odd again yeah. you know it's like you know he's, he should have kind of known that before he yeah. started the tour if you're going to try to travel with two kids it's not going to be easy you know but uh but anyway yeah just a couple of uh just a couple of quick news items there uh wanted to get out there uh so uh bob yes. is is a friend is a friend of and a fan of what I meant to say, the TV show Goliath. This is uh, just to give you a quick, uh, uh, quick look at some of the uh, uh, Wikipedia facts on on Goliath. It just the, the fourth season just debuted on Amazon uh, at the end of September, uh, so it, it's been there a couple of weeks. Uh, this show stars uh, Billy Bob Thornton, uh, William Hurt, uh, Maria Bello, who used to be on uh, ER, and uh, a few other names, uh, a few other recognized people. Lou Diamond Phillips, I think, turns up at some point in it. Uh, it's just debuted its fourth season. There, I think there are eight episode seasons, and this is a uh, Amazon original. It's on Amazon uh, Prime Video, uh, produced by Amazon Studios and David E. Kelly Productions. David E. Kelly was a guy who did a lot of uh, was successful with a lot of network shows back in the day. Uh, so anyway, uh, Bob, tell us about Goliath and why and why you're excited about season four. Okay, well, I have to say also I I finished season four, so I've now seen all four seasons, and reportedly season four is the final season for the series. Um, I'm excited about it because first off, I love Billy Bob Thornton. I think he's a great actor. He's incredibly versatile. You know, he can go from comedy to dark drama. And I don't think anybody can can do, I don't want to use the word evil, but can project an aura of ominence better than, than Billy Bob Thornton. And um, this series, I've really enjoyed it. Every, every, every season has been eight episodes, so it's a fairly easy thing to get through, you know, if you want to sit and binge it over a weekend or something. Um, the plots have been uh, kind of intricate. And it's a uh, rip from the headlines type thing. Uh, the very first season dealt with uh, corporate murder and uh, Billy Bob Thornton's character, uh, Billy McBride, is kind of a washed up alcoholic lawyer who at one point was involved, you know, with the largest law corporation around, which the, hence the term Goliath. And it deals with his interactions with that and, and this corporate murder thing. And then the second season dealt with gangland murders and, you know, um, municipal corruption. The third season was really bizarre. It dealt with uh, the drought in California and um, a woman dying because her, her farmland collapsed because people had been pumping out all the water under it. And then the fourth season deals with the opioid um, crisis. I think the fourth season is kind of like maybe the weakest of the four, but it also has J.K. Simmons in it, whom I think is another great actor. And J.K. Simmons does a song and dance routine, and it's worth the <laughs> price of admission alone <laughs> to watch him do this. I can't wait to see that. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it was great. And um, there's a little bit of cliche in the thing, you know, with Thornton playing, you know, the divorced alcoholic lawyer, finding redemption and such. But he pulls it off really well. And uh, like there's a line in, in the first season somewhere where he says something to the effect of, you know, don't make me stoop to what I'm capable of. And, uh, you know, so it, it, I think it's a great series. And um, Thornton can pull stuff off like this. Like the, the movie The Alamo it was a dog of a movie. But Thornton played Davy Crockett and brought oh. stuff to Crockett's character that had never been seen before, like uh, Crockett Rise at the Alamo. 
only to be told that, well, you know, the Santa Ana's coming. And you get this look on his face going, oh, I thought the fighting was over. <laughs> and at one point, you know, in the movie, he talks about, if I was just David Crockett, I'd be over those walls. But I'm Davy Crockett, so I kind of got it stuck. <laughs> and, you know, so he, he just brought this element to stuff that I think is really unique. So anyway, I recommend the series. Uh, I, you know, it's a little trippy. And there are times when I think it's a little bit of excess, but, you know, Billy Bob Thornton can chew up scenery forever and I'll watch him. Yeah, it, it, uh, uh, I know you were pretty excited about it with, uh, before you uh, went to watch the fourth season and you said it, it kind of was it was the fourth season a disappointment or <laughs> or is it just uh, or, or is it just it was, kind it of a, uh, just not quite little... as good? Yeah, it was a little bit of a disappointment. Okay. Um, I I thought that it got a little too far out into the nether world, you know. And I don't want to give away the plot, but um, there's a lot of stuff with um, Thornton's character going off into kind of a dream sequence stuff, and and um, I thought the plot was a little, just a little inconceivable but still you know the watching the actors was fun yeah so. yeah I, I i watched the first couple episodes of the first season the other day uh and uh yeah i'm with i'm with you i could watch billy bob thornton and anything yeah you know, my my one of my favorite things that he did was the first season of fargo yes a few years awesome. ago he was great in that um uh, and so I could watch him and anything. And there, there were a couple of characters. I like to say I watched the first couple episodes. I want I want to continue with it, uh, you know, because it was it was good enough that I want to continue with it. But I wasn't I wasn't so much of uh, a fan of of or not so much a fan of where the plot seems to be going. It's like one of these uh, real intricate conspiracy, corporate conspiracy mm -hmm. sort of things where, you know, the tentacles reach everywhere. And every time you turn around, you know, if I, there, there's some new revelation about somebody mm -hmm. in power, you know, it, it's like, it's like this whole intricate thing. And I'm, I'm not so much a fan of those kind of plots. It's like, yeah, I've been there, done that, but, but Billy Bob is worth watching. And there's a woman, I don't know what the actress's name is, but the actress who played, and I don't know if she's last past the uh, first few episodes or if she's a continuing character or what but she she was a realtor who also is like a dime store lawyer and, that, and her character is really entertaining to watch she, she's like in all character. four seasons okay okay I, I really liked her character now the wife's not so much what i did hate in the first two episodes was a william hurt character i just uh, it's like oh my god when i have scenes of him on the screen i just it's like come on let's get out let's get over this is ridiculous. He, he's uh, very prevalent in the first season um pretty much gone in seasons two and three and then pops back up oh, okay because it's because it's like he's just like he's just like a it's just like the batman villain as re, a you know reject batman villain from a bad batman comic or something you know it's like it's got a disfigured face you only see him in the shadows and he's always sitting there with a clicker and flipping a clicker all the time and and you know he's a devious and nobody knows him he's this mysterious presence it's like yeah yeah go go on you know i yeah. about that yeah. the one thing you <laughs> won't like is that every season does have this intricate interweaving of plots and characters yeah and the, so so you, you'll probably find that a little bit of a drag yeah i'll say i'm not a fan of that and i'm not expecting this to be one of my favorite shows of all time but but the first two episodes is is billy bob was was watchable enough that that, that I'm, I'm going to continue for a little while with it anyway. I'll, I'll probably end up watching the whole thing. But uh, but yeah, so thumbs up from big thumbs up from Bob. So yes. uh, if you're looking for something to watch uh, uh, and you and you and you like lawyer shows and you like good acting and you like Billy Bob Thornton, uh, go for it. Uh, looks like it could be good. It, it has some promise, but. Uh, it, it possibly might get better for me as I go on. Uh, okay. Uh, on 30 years ago, October 11th, 1991. There's a good one to start off our anniversaries. Apple Computer paid the Beatles, Apple, uh, uh, Apple Corporation, the record label, 
Apple Computers paid them $29 million to settle a trademark infringement suit in the UK. I had never heard this before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Apple, Apple, yeah. Apple Corporation. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm sorry. Apple Computers started mm -hmm. up, and 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 the and the Beatles, Apple, Apple Corporation said, "Hey, wait a minute, that's our yeah. name." <laughs> so they got in a little legal fight. So Apple Computers paid Apple Corporation, uh, paid Apple Corporation twenty nine million dollars mm -hmm. to like let them go ahead and use the name Apple for a few years until you know, and then of course Apple Corporation went away, and that wasn't a thing anymore. <laughs> uh, Tuesday, 66 years ago, on 12th of October, 1955, is when the Chrysler Corporation launched a series of high-fidelity record players built into their 1956 model cars. Mm. Did you know this? Yes, I did. <laughs> The record player, I you know, this was the day before CDs or the day before cassettes, so I had to have some some way to uh, get your music in your car, right? I can't even imagine how this would have looked, how this would have worked. But but the, it measured about four inches high, less than a foot wide, and was mounted under the instrument panel. Uh, they uh, uh, the seven it, it played seven inch discs, and they spun at sixteen and two thirds RPM. Yeah, I, I wrote about that in a piece on our Geezerology webpage, and it was primarily about this thing that they had at one point where you could get these 45 record RPM records that were foldable, and like you could carry them in your back pocket. Oh, were, okay, I remember that. I didn't remember this specific part yeah, of and it. I, and I made yeah. an allusion to that thing about the car record players. Okay, okay, okay yeah. It, uh, uh, there were These things were just continued in 1961 so they lasted they lasted uh, five years never did catch on and they got well, i remember also when the cds first started coming out you could have these little portable cd players i'm almost like a walkman but it was for a compact disc and you could then get an adapter to you know play it in your car stereo and it was a pain in the butt because every time you hit a bump the cd would skip so, yeah. yeah i can't imagine how they did it with records I remember that. Yeah, I remember not too long ago, uh, you know, get little, uh, I guess, iPods and, 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 you know, just more generic MP3 players. That's how I used to listen to music in my car after my CD player broke in my car. I, <laughs> I kept hooking up my, uh, I kept hooking up my uh, MP3 player to the car. No, I, I still use an iPod. No. <laughs> I modded it with one of the big um, um, micro discs things inside it. No. Tuesday will be the 64th anniversary of when Little Richard publicly renounced rock and roll and embraced God. He did this during a during a uh, tour in Australia. He was in Australia at a show in Australia, and he announced this during his show. He told the story of dreaming of his own damnation after praying to God when one of the engines on a plane he was on caught fire. <laughs> Scared the bejesus out of them, apparently. <laughs> or, or scared the Jesus. Or scared into the bejesus him. into him. Yeah, yeah. He, uh, uh, little Richard, he threw four diamond rings valued at eighteen at eight thousand dollars into the Hunter River in Sydney, Australia, and soon after launched a gospel career. Five years later, he switched back to rock. <laughs> <laughs> Tuesday, 43 years ago, uh, Sex Pistols' Sid Vicious called the police to say that someone had stabbed his girlfriend, Nancy Spungen. Sid was arrested and charged with murder and placed in the detox unit at a New York prison. Uh, but he died of a heroin overdose before he could ever go to trial. Uh, 36 years ago, Tuesday, uh, was the death from AIDS of Ricky Wilson of the B-52s. That they uh, B-52s, they they continued on without him, and they're still working to this day. Ricky was the was the brother of uh, Cindy Wilson, who was one of the two uh, uh, singers in the band. Uh, also, uh, on Tuesday is the twenty fourth anniversary of the death of John. 
Denver, who was killed in a plane crash. I swear to goodness, since I started doing these, I had no idea of how many how many musicians and, and stars have yeah. died in plane crashes. And and and, and Scott, one note with John Denver, he uh, died in the plane crash, the plane that he was operating. He was flying one of the ultralights. Right, 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 the, right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. He was, yeah. It says he was, it was a handmade yeah. experimental airplane that he was flying. He ran out of gas. He ran out of gas and crashed off the coast of Monterey Bay, California. Um, Wednesday, five years ago, Wednesday, Bob Dylan was awarded the Nobel Prize for Literature. He was the first songwriter to win that prize. Uh, he received uh, the, the, Nobel Committee awarded him the prize for having created new poetic expressions within the great American song tradition. Saturday will be the 39th anniversary of the dissolution of Credence Clearwater Revival. They just released the album Mardi Gras, which was uh, their, which is not a very well received album. The first, uh, they got the first. Uh, bad reviews of their career with that album, Mardi Gras. Uh, and uh, yeah, of course, John Fogarty went off to have a long, successful uh, solo career, uh, center field, rock and roll girls. Uh, and, and Tom Fogarty, his brother, died in September 1990. The other two members of the band, uh, the two non-Fogartys, uh, went on to tour as Credence Clearwater Revisited for a time. Also Saturday, the 15th anniversary of, uh, of the closing of uh, CBGB in New York, the punk club in New York that uh, credited with, uh, you know, that, that's where Patti Smith, the Ramones, Blondie, Talking Heads, all that generation of, uh, of, of people uh, got their start at the CBGB. It, was, it, it opened in December 1973. Its full name was CBGB OMFUG, which stood for Country Bluegrass Blues and Other Music for Uplifting Gormandizers. <laughs> Gets me why they only used initials. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but yeah, it, it, that's where to start up country bluegrass blues and other music. Well, you know, what they became famous for was the other music that wasn't listed there, right? right? Birthdays. Monday, today is the 71st birthday of Daryl Hall, half of Hall and Oates. Uh, he was inducted into the Songwriters Hall of Fame in 2004. Hall and Oates have sold an estimated 40 million records. They're the third best selling duo of all time. Tuesday will be the 86th birthday of Luciano Pavarotti, Italian opera singer, who died on uh, in September 2007. Also Tuesday will be the 86th birthday of Sam Moore, half of Sam and Dave, who is still with us. Soul Man was their big hit, 1967. Wednesday. Paul Simon will be 80 years old. Bridge over troubled water, Simon Garfunkel. Uh, yep, he's had a long, uh, long solo career after Simon Garfunkel broke up. Wednesday will be the 77th birthday of Robert Lamb, keyboardist, singer, and songwriter with Chicago. He's the one he sang. He sang lead on. Does anybody really know what time it is? Uh, that was that was probably the biggest hit that he sang lead on. Wednesday will be the seventy fourth birthday of Sammy Hagar. I guess I guess he yeah he was with Montrose. He was known as a he had a pretty good uh, solo career, but I, probably he's best known as the guy who replaced David Lee Roth and Van Halen, right? Also, Wednesday, the 73rd birthday of John Ford Coley. England Dan and John Ford. England Dan, John Ford. Yeah. 
62 on Wednesday. Who will turn 62 years old? Marie Osmond. You remember she her? Pretty cute, good. Little, cute little 17 year old. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Annie well, she, Marie. She still looks pretty good on those NutraSmart <laughs> or the NutraFit commercials. <laughs> She and her brother Donnie Osmond hosted a television variety show, variety show, Donnie and Marie, for a couple of years. I saw I, I, I saw a couple of clips on that on YouTube, and God, it was so damn cheesy. <laughs> <laughs> and then Donnie, I guess, went on to have some kind of Vegas act for a long time. Yeah, yeah. I think I think they did as a duo. They did a Vegas act for quite a while as a duo. They may still be doing it. Thursday will be the 75th birthday of songwriter, singer, and guitarist Justin Hayward of the Moody Blues. They still get together and uh, do some shows every now and then. Friday will be the 86th birthday of Barry Maguire. Remember Barry Maguire? Eve of, Eve of Destruction. Eve of Destruction, yeah. yep. 1965. Big, huge hit 1965. Uh, he was uh, uh, he, he recorded that with uh, with some guys who were in the uh, in the uh, uh, band the Wrecking Crew, you know the the famous uh, studio band Wrecking Crew. But the uh, uh, funny thing about that song is that that vocal is really that really snarly uh, gnarly vocal that he does on that, which is so distinctive. Well, apparently that that vocal was thrown on the uh uh was thrown on the uh, track of the, it, it was just a rough mix it was just you know it was just intended to put on there for uh, uh to 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 demo the song to radio stations but uh but some dj uh got it and the dj it was a the, the thing was embargoed but they just wanted to get the song out of the radio station but some dj just grabbed it anyway and put it on the air and it, and and it just kind of mushroomed into this big hit so they said well hell i guess that's our <laughs> that's our song they never did go back and replace the vocal on it but that was just supposed to be a, a, a demo it wasn't supposed to be the final mm -hmm. mix on a demo but uh, may uh, i interject here yeah um real deep trivia and this this is for us uh since we all have a springfield missouri connection there was a band in springfield called the morales and they yeah. did a cover of eve of destruction and in their version, they changed the reference to the Jordan River, to bodies floating in the Jordan River, to bodies floating in the James River, which right. you know, goes through the Springfield area. And that was a reference to uh, an old-time sheriff there in uh, Christian County outside Springfield, who back in the 60s and 70s uh, was renowned for loving to beat up on hippies and stuff. And it was Buck Lamb. And uh, yep. so they, they did a little reference to him and his hippie punishing days. Right. The Morels, and, and for for those of you who who don't know, the, the Morels actually uh, morphed into a band called the Skeletons, which uh, uh, which which they had they had they had a bit of success for for a time during the eighties and the nineties out of Springfield. Well, mostly the Lou that was they were led by Lou Whitney, who who became a, a pretty popular uh, record producer for for a number of, of bands at the time. Uh, Friday, they, they were also known that, that, that they, for a time they were known as the Skeletons. Remember uh, Jim Wonderly when Jim Wonderly was our lead singer? No, I'm sorry, the Symptoms, the Symptoms in, in the Wonderly phase. Uh, that was all when I was in college. Uh, Friday will be the 75th birthday of Richard Carpenter, sister, I'm sorry, brother of Karen of the Carpenters. Uh, did you know that the Carpenters' 1972 hit Goodbye to Love was one of the first pop ballads that featured a fuzz guitar solo? And, and, and a lot of people trace that song as the uh, origin of the genre that we now know as, uh, as power pop. <laughs> Scott, couldn't you also say that uh, a lot of the albums that... Uh... Karen and Richard Carpenter made, they used a lot of the studio musicians out of, you know, uh, Southern California, like the Wrecking Crew. Right, right yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. so. 
I have a lot of a, a lot of I have a lot of fans among among successful musicians of the of the next generation. Uh, there was a there was an album that came out uh, I don't know in the early two thousands sometime called "If I Were a Carpenter," which was a uh, it, which is a lot of different bands doing a uh, cover of a Carpenter tune. My favorite one from that was when uh, Sonic Youth did uh, "Superstar," which is the old Leon Russell song. Uh, Friday will be the 68th birthday of Tito Jackson, Michael's older brother, from the Jackson Five. Saturday would have been the 83rd birthday of Krista Pofkin, better known as Nico, songwriter, musician, model, and actress. Uh, she, uh, yeah, she, she, she played with, uh, she did a few solo albums, uh, sang on the Velvet Underground albums, uh, appeared in several Andy Warhol films. Uh, she died in 1988 from a brain hemorrhage uh, after she was on, uh, she was on a bicycle tour with her son of, uh, of Ibiza and uh, she fell, went down, hit her head and, uh, concussed herself and died of a brain hemorrhage. Uh, okay, Saturday will be the 78th birthday of Fred Turner, the Turner of Bachman Turner Overdrive. It'll be 78. Uh, uh, Saturday will be the 74th birthday of Bob Weir, uh, one of the founding members of the Grateful Dead. Saturday will be the 52nd birthday of Wendy Wilson, daughter of Brian Wilson, uh, mm -hmm. one of the vocalists in uh, Wilson Phillips, who had a few hits in the 90s, late 80s, early 90s. Sunday will be the 80th birthday of Jim Seals. Um, I know you know Jim Seals, right? Yeah. Seals and Cross. No. Add from, and Croft, no S on Croft. And, and just add from the greater Kansas City area originally, I believe. Oh, really? Okay. This is funny. When I ran across this, this is what I ran across. Uh, Sunday will be the 74th birthday of vocalist and bassist David St. Hubbins. Some, some news organization ask, actually listed this. David St. Hubbins, of course, is a fictional character. Mm -hmm. uh, Sunday, the, the 74th mm -hmm. birthday on Sunday is actually Michael McKean, the guy who played no. uh, <laughs> David St. Hubbins. I know I have, time, yeah. right? <laughs> <laughs> also, Michael McKean also, you know, he, he appeared in all those Christopher Guest movies, you know, Waiting for Guffman and the one with the dog show, the best in show and all those. He was, he, he, he was also... Uh, uh, Lenny on uh, on uh, uh, Laverne and Shirley, right? Sunday will be the fifty third birthday of Ziggy Marley, son of Bob Marley. Uh, currently of uh, Ziggy Marley and the Melody Makers, and wrapping it up, Sunday will be the forty ninth birthday of Marshall Bruce Mathers the third better known as Eminem, U.S. rapper Eminem, who had a big hit with uh, the real Slim Shady in the year 2000. Anyway, that's anniversaries and birthdays. Anybody have anything to uh, jump in with? Yeah, I got one little thing that I think will kind of tie in to the stuff that you do, Scott. And um, it involves the King Elvis Presley. And Elvis is possibly going to lose another point on his crown. And right now, Elvis holds the record for the most performances in Las Vegas. And he did 837 shows in the Sin City. And uh, Barry Manilow has just signed a contract with Westgate Las Vegas Resort and Casino that takes him through 2023. And if he completes the contract, he will beat Elvis's record for the most shows by a single performer in the Sin City. And uh, Westgate is actually the same place where Elvis set his record for the most number of shows. So, 
So I guess Las Vegas is where you go if you're an aging rocker. Wow. Yeah, Bob, I'm not totally surprised. I'm surprised that there's that demand for Barry Manilow. But then again, if you want a Vegas, you know, big lounge jack band sound lounge act, you know, that's the thing. I, 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 I know that Presley did stuff in Las Vegas. I did not know it was to that extent. And it's kind of of a sad. I didn't thing. realize that either. Yeah, it's kind of a sad commentary when you think about where Elvis started, you know, and the snarling, um, hip shaking rock performer who, you know, morphed into the B movie guy and then ended up in Las Vegas. Oh uh, yeah, I, yeah. I, I, a sad commentary might be kind of harsh, but but it but it certainly was an evolution. <laughs> <laughs> you know the you know the, the the Elvis of those years was not the Elvis that uh, you know I, appeared on first on the Ed Sullivan show. Yeah, yeah. And neither, I, and neither and neither was the Elvis Elvis who did all those movies around the uh, turn of the sixties. Bob, I, 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 that I speaking of you know Elvis and his you know time in Las Vegas, I, I put the blame on his management, Colonel Tom Parker. Oh, absolutely. He absolutely. he melted Elvis for everything he could. He did not have his best interest at heart. I mean, I thought when he did his comeback, uh, the 1968 concert, it was like, in a way, it was kind of like, hey, the old Elvis is back. And if he had gotten with, I think, the right musicians, they would have loved to have, performed, you know, written songs mm -hmm. for Elvis and all that. I even read an article, well, this many years ago, that Bruce Springsteen wanted to hook up with Elvis. Uh, you know, in the mid seventies, but of course that would never happen. You know, Elvis is right. Elvis is Elvis. And <laughs> yeah. Do you, so, do you have a do you have a list there of Vegas performers, or is that or is that just a just a quick news I headline? That was just a, that was just a separate little quick. Oh, news okay, item. because because it made me wonder because uh, you know Penn and Teller uh, have been there for a lot of years. I just wonder where they fall on that list of, of, of the number of shows. So they've been there for a long time now, right. you know, in residence at the Penn and Teller Theater at the at the Rio. Yeah. Well, yeah. The, the news article says um, um, that Presley holds the record as a performer. It doesn't specifically say singer or, or musician. So uh -huh. I don't know whether there's yeah. somebody out there that may have a whole higher record than that as a performer. So I don't know. But oh, OK. Uh, uh, just you know, it just so came to mind. Yeah, but, Nothing important. But you know, it's interesting. I think David Lee Roth is is going to be living in Las Vegas now, and um, Rod Stewart has taken up residency in Las Vegas. Now they haven't said anything about them being permanent performers there, but yeah. you know, I guess, so. I guess it's kind of like you know, uh, country and pop people go to Branson to end their careers, and now rock people yeah. are going to Vegas. I spent the summer there in Vegas in uh, 2016. I know Donnie and Marie were, you know, had a, they were one of the headliners there when I was there. I don't know if they're still there or not. Uh, anyway, okay, well, that's, uh, that's Geezerology Gazette for this week. Uh, thanks for tuning in, everybody. We'll be back next Sunday with some more uh, discussion of news and TV shows or movies or whatever strikes our fancy, whatever we come up with this week. Uh, come back with us on uh, Wednesday. We'll have a, a music discussion of uh, Simon and Garfunkel's uh, Sounds of Silence album. That'll be Wednesday. And uh, over the next couple of weeks, we, what we have coming up, we're going to revisit uh, this sort of an obscure, uh, funny thing that has just resurfaced recently called Phantom's Divine Comedy, which was uh, uh, which is an interesting uh, released back in 1974 and uh, uh, next week Marissa will be with us next week to talk about a man that she introduced us to named Ben Howard and here in a couple three weeks uh, Bob and his daughters and maybe D and maybe I are going to go see the Doors movie so we'll talk about that uh, I guess that comes up around the beginning of November but anyway we have some uh, have some pretty good things planned so come back and join us uh, thanks for listening, everybody. So long. All right. Take care.